Hi everyone, thank you ever so much for uh, joining us today for another exciting um, webinar as part of the International Affairs webinar series. Um, as you'll know, International Affairs is Chatham House's academic journal, so a big welcome um, both to Chatham House members today and to International Affairs reading, readers joining us um, for this event. Um, so my name is Leah Dehan, I'm a project manager at Chatham House, um, and I'm also the Institute's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Chair. Um, so the International Affairs team has very kindly asked me to chair today's event. So a big thank you to you and in particular, of course, to Isabel for putting this all together. Um, so in today's event, we're going to be discussing um, the United Nations progress in furthering gender equality, in particular by looking at the United Nations Security Council resolution on women, peace and security, but also at looking at the way that civil society groups um, are working to influence the work towards um, gender equality more generally. Um, now, as you may know, International Affairs has done a lot of um, work in publishing pieces on um, the UN's role um, in gender equality, and in particular on um, WPS. Um, and this work has looked at sort of a very wide variety of ways that you can engage with the topic. So we've published pieces um, on queering WPS, decolonizing peace building um, to feminist interventions in Security Council policy. Um, so we'll make sure throughout today's event to share lots of links to the articles, um, special issues, um, but also some of the previous events that we run on this um, topic. Um, so building on this foundation and sort of continuing the vital work of understanding um, the UN's work towards gender inclusion, um, I'm joined today by three brilliant international affairs authors. Um, who will be um, talking through their work um, in this area and in particular on seeing some of the difficult points um, where further work is needed. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce you to them. So first we have Andreas Heiker. She is Professor of Global Governance at Zeppelin University in Friedrichshafen, Germany. And her recent article appeared in the July issue of International Affairs and is entitled The UN and Women's Marginalization and Peace Negotiations. So thank you so much for joining us today, Andrea. Uh, second, we have Chaisa Pachot. She is a PhD student in political science at the Federal University of Rio de Grande do Sol in Brazil. She co-authored, co sorry, she co-authored an article um, in the May issue with Caitlin Hamilton and Laura Shepherd. And this article is entitled um, BRICS Countries and the Construction of Conflict in the Women, Peace and Security Open Debates. So thank you so much for being here today as well. Um, and then first, uh, third and last, but definitely not least, we are joined by Irem Ebeter. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the WZB Social Sciences Center in Berlin, Germany. Her article was also in the July um, issue and was co-authored with Jelena Supak and is entitled Backlash, Advocacy and NGO Polarization over Women's Rights in the United Nations. So thank you, Irem, for being here today as well. Um, now, before I hand over to our brilliant uh, three panellists, there's a couple of housekeeping pieces that um, I should go over. So first, as you can see, today's event is on the record and will be recorded. Um, and second, um, the sort of order of the event will be that each of our brilliant speakers will make a short um, introductory remark, after which we will go to the Q&A section. Um, now, in the Q&A section, we are hoping to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. So make sure that you use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen, and you can submit questions throughout um, the event and we'll come to them afterwards. Um, brilliant. So I think there is um, there's a really great quote, which I think is in your um, piece, Iram, which says, feminists have never had an easy um, time advancing women's rights at the UN. And I think this is sort of at the heart of what we're discussing today. Um, and I think it's very important that we learn from the sort of difficult points, but also um, that we sort of look forward and think about solutions and the ways that we can make meaningful change. So I hope maybe in the Q&A section as well, you can keep these points in mind and we can talk about solutions and possible ways to walk towards this. Um, so I will now hand over to our speakers. So let's start with you, Andrea. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the problems that are caused by dictating the role that women should take up in peace negotiations. 
Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this great event and for having me here. It's a great pleasure uh, for me. So last time I spoke about WPS, my husband broke his arm. I hope uh, this time I won't be interrupted and have to run away and bring him to the hospital. So wish me luck. Um, I guess, as we all know, the, the UN Security Council's resolution 1325 demands the increased participation of women in all stages of a peace process. Yet, uh, while at least in academia, the integration of women into peacekeeping has gained a lot of attention, the role of women in peace negotiations, in turn, especially as negotiators in track one negotiations, is a rather neglected topic. And this is what I will talk about uh, briefly. Um, if we look at the figures, we see that between 2015 and 2019, women constituted on average only 14% of negotiators in major peace processes worldwide. So women are largely absent from the negotiation table, which is why the UN and other proponents of the WPS agenda are putting forward certain arguments to increase women's participation, um, but I will argue that those are sort of problematic. You can find uh, those arguments in uh, a number of policy reports published on behalf of the UN and other international actors, and those are based on uh, one particular narrative according to which the participation of women adds value to peace negotiations and makes them more effective. And according to my critical reading of these policy reports, this narrative does not empower women, but rather contributes to their marginalization in peace negotiations. And I will briefly explain why this narrative has rather negative effects, whether intended or not, uh, I cannot tell. So I'm, I'm not blaming uh, people here. But according to this narrative, women as value added, women first are set to bring to the negotiation table issues that go beyond hard security, such as human rights and women's rights. Second, women are expected to be gentler than men and therefore help to overcome stalemates and to find compromise. Third, women are set to have close links to women's groups and civil society in general, and therefore can secure buy-in from large parts of society. While I do not question that women's participation in peace negotiations might have sad effects, I argue that this narrative also has marginalizing effects for women. So first, this narrative of uh, women as adding value to peace negotiation leaves women little room for maneuver in the negotiations. It limits the scope of issues that women are expected to deal with and therefore limits their capacity to impact the negotiations. If women do not live up to the expectations raised by international actors that one can find in those reports, for example, if women do not promote women's issues, but rather follow a nationalist agenda in the negotiations, they risk losing the support of the international actors who, however, are important in pushing for the participation of women in the first place. Second, the narrative of women as adding value to peace negotiations might also conflict with gender conceptions of domestic negotiation parties, so that um, what international actors consider to be appropriate behavior for women is considered as inappropriate by the domestic negotiation parties. The latter might, for example, consider the inclusion of women's issues into the negotiations as derailing the process, they might consider gentle women as being too weak to lead and consider women's links to women's groups as bringing new constituencies to the table and hence as a risk to their own power, which is why um, domestic negotiators might exclude women from the negotiations based on the very same gender stereotypes that lead international actors to praise women's participation in peace negotiations. So this narrative puts women into a trap. If they conform to the expectations raised by internationals, they might be rejected by the local power holders. If they, however, break with the script that internationals seek to impose, they risk losing the support of the international actors. So in sum, this narrative that is promoted to my reading in the policy reports is neither suited to increase women's impact on peace negotiations nor to increase women's participations in these negotiations. Instead, it contributes to their marginalization and even exclusion from the negotiations. 
So the big question is how to move forward and increase women's participations in peace negotiations. I don't think that I'm very well suited to make suggestions, but um, one idea that came out of the analysis is that instead of promoting gender stereotypes, the UN and other proponents of the WPS agenda should rather identify who the domestic gatekeepers are and what their objections to women's participations are, and then address these objections and give women the support and resources they need. But I guess that others are better suited to make additional and maybe even better suggestions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you for that uh, brilliant um, introductory remark. I've got many other questions that I'm hoping we'll be able to get to in the Q&A. Um, but that was incredibly interesting. And I think there is sort of um, a parallel maybe um, with your work, Heisa, um, if we're talking about sort of the narrow conceptualization of women um, as roles as negotiators, perhaps there's also then in turn a narrow conceptualization of WPS um, by some of the actors that you've studied in, in, in your article. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the, the understanding of WPS within the BRICS countries and, and your research on them more generally. Yeah, of course, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so the, the narrative uh, of the WPS agenda is based on the positions that the state located in the global north are the are zones of peace and providers. Uh, and uh, in the other hand, the uh, south is zones of conflict and recipients. And the BRICS counters are very interesting in this uh, issue because they challenge these associations, interrogating and operating with them. So they are not exactly zones of peace, but they are not zones of conflict. This is very, very particular of BRICS and uh, try to disincentify the idea that the BRICS are a collective just when we're talking about, about financial issues, but they can be a kind of, sort of collective when you're talking about uh, political, social and uh, gender. In that case, the issues also. So um, our main arg argument in this article is that BRICS countries are uh, driving more by identity making geopolitical constructions than by politics of peace. So when they are talking in uh, open debate of WPS, they're not talking specifically about uh, uh, a uh, achieve gender equality or how their uh, their progress in the matter, but they are trying to to show that they are peaceful, to show that they are they are not uh, a zone of uh, of uh, conflict. Uh, we analyzed the thirty three um, transcripts of uh, the um, the open debate, and uh, in all of them we can we could find uh, similarities. Between among the, the BRICS countries. Uh, as a collective, they have a complicated picture of the human rights. Uh, and at the same time, they make some commitments to the WPS agenda. This space should be a diplomatic practice. I'll, actually, opportunity, an opportunity to the countries articulate their versions, visions of the WPS agenda. But in practice, what they try to do is to uh, represent themselves as, as um, strong uh, and uh, as uh, trying to make a difference to the others. It's always about the others. So this is the main uh, similarity among the, the, these countries. Brazil and South Africa, they try to show it, uh, uh, especially about uh, regional collaborations. China and India always try to show how independent uh, leaders and uh, their engagement uh, with the other states and provide, of providing expertise and resources. And Russia always make uh, some uh, reference to the fractions relationships with the Ukraine and Georgia, for example. Uh, they, are, they have uh, this um, thing of trying to show 
that the violence that is happening in the other countries doesn't happen in their country. So the violence, uh, the insecurity, something that doesn't belong, that don't belong to, to BRICS. Uh, they always reaffirm their status as peaceful state and, of course, deny their applicability of the uh, WPS agenda to their own context. Uh, Africa, in a really general uh, way, is the kind of place that the WPS agenda is applicable, not these other countries. These discursive uh, constructions uh, show that the ongoing conflict and violence inside the borders aren't, uh, aren't necessary, aren't important. They, they try to deny this uh, conflict and violence. Actually, what they are trying to show is that uh, this, uh, the WPS agenda is not a, a domestic public, uh, public policy but uh, a foreign public policy. Um, th this uh, is a contradictory, a paradox, if we show the numbers, if we show what's happening in these countries, not just in China, India, Russia, that uh, actually have a conflictual relationship with the other states and territories, but also in Brazil and South Africa, that uh, th there is no ongoing conflict, but high levels of violence against the uh, women. And finally, uh, the BRICS counters statement uh, is like a clear distinction between active conflict and insecurity, the everyday forms of violence, and between WPS as a foreign and domestic policy concern, as I already said. I can explore a little bit what uh, we can do <laughs> to try to, to change this situation later. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you ever so much, Haisa. I think it's so interesting to see. Um, the sort of um, uncomfortable position, if you will, that the BRICS countries may be occupying, sort of mirroring maybe what some of the global northern countries are doing in their interpretation of BRICS, but then also still really appealing to this sort of South-South collaboration um, narrative. So there's loads there that I'm hoping we can unpack in the questions. Um, now, um, turning to you, um, Irem, I think a lot of the conversations that we've just had in the opening remarks on sort of implementation and interpretation of WPS um, are happening in sort of a wider environment within the UN where there is a real conflict about what the, the priority for, of women's rights should be and a sort of a, a pushing for them and a pushing against. So I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit generally about the environment in which this is happening. Thank you very much, Leah. So I'll briefly um, describe what is going on when it comes to gender politics and NGOs in the UN. So um, how they are affecting women's rights and how they collide actually. So uh, when we talk about NGOs in the UN, now we have two groups in mind. So this was not the case. Maybe researchers 20 years ago did not have to deal with uh, this anti-feminist conservative network, but here they are and they make their voices heard now. So first uh, group is the feminist NGOs. And I'm making these divisions very crudely, I know, because there is no one feminist NGO coalition, although they are trying to come together. And the other group is what I what we call conservative anti-feminist NGOs. And both of these groups uh, are trying to bring the UN agenda to their own normative goals. And, and both of them are using the UN as a platform to further their goals. And what we mean by using uh, as a platform is using the institutional space provided by the UN. And particularly, this is a Commission on the Status of Women, CSW, and Human Rights Council. So this is mainly where the battle is going on heavily today. And the second thing that is what they are doing is they are trying to uh, change UN language, UN norms, UN concepts. And for feminists, for, for a long time, this is gender equality and LGBTQ plus rights. And for, for the conservatives, for the anti-feminist actors, um, the meta-narrative is rights of the family, what they call natural family. So what we are seeing is a clash of these two concepts, again, very broadly. 
And both sides blame each other. Both sides blame the UN and both sides are trying to change things. So there is, it's a battle zone in terms of gender rights. And this, this is particularly uh, new and I would say 10, 20, not, not even 20 years. So uh, mid 2000s, but it escalated uh, around 2010 or so. This was, not, this was not the case. As you said, Leah, it was not uh, an easy battle for feminists, but it was not this kind of a battle as well. So it was a different battle. They were trying to um, persuade states. They were trying to uh, make some progress in documents, resolutions, but they did not have a rival NGO group in the UN. And of course, there was Holocy, there was Vatican, there was religious NGOs, they were, uh, they were always contesting there, but uh, they did not have a transnational network. They did not have this alliance of states, NGOs. And of course, what we see in the world is political climate is, uh, it, it was not like this. So we did not have a Trump uh, as you, you know, United States president, for instance. So th those kinds of um, changes, big political events made them heard. And uh, again, they did not have a meta frame uh, like a natural family. So they did not have anything to unite them. But now what we see is that uh, all these different states with different religious organizations or orientations, very different ideologies can come together to protect what they call the natural family. So this is what we call a meta frame. And that's very important for them um, to, to come together and to further their cause. So then two things, this opportunity structure and uh, meta frame is what is different different today and what faces uh, feminist NGOs in the UN. And uh, what are the goals of these anti-feminist uh, actors? Because we know about feminists. There is a huge literature about feminist presence in the UN. But uh, these new groups are um, sort of a mystery for us. Because first of all, we, we would not predict their presence in the UN because UN is their institutional rival or this is what the literature would have presumed. So the uh, UN is a liberal oriented uh, organization. It's globalist, it's secularist. So we would assume these actors would uh, play in their own domestic league or just in their regional organizations, but this is not the case. So what they say is that, uh, first of all, they realize that UN is a powerful actor. So when there is a resolution, it can affect uh, legal norms. It can change laws, actually. And this is, this is first where they come from. And then uh, on the basis of this, they say that UN is hijacked by this radical feminists or radical uh, gender rights groups. And they say we have to fight this and we have to gain UN. We have to use UN. So in that sense, they are playing the game that feminists have been playing for the last 30 years. So this transna transnational mobilization, using the rights language, uh, trying to build resolutions, again, using the rights language. It's, it's, there's a lot of mimicking going on there in terms of transnational feminist mobilization. So this is, uh, this is the positive goal. So changing resolutions, changing the language, but it's also uh, and the negative goal, what we call stop all the feminist games. And uh, stop feminists and do not let them further their cause because they think it's too much. It has been too much uh, for the last 10 years or so. And they have been uh, successful in halting some progress, in blocking some resolutions. I don't want to give much details, but if there are questions, we can talk about what they have actually achieved. And uh, one implication of these two groups coming together uh, inside the UN is um, what we observe is uh, polarization. So uh, polarization is a term that we see a lot in domestic politics and usually as a negative term, as um, something that hinders democratic progress and uh, there is no compromise, can, uh, sides cannot hear each other anymore. And we observe a similar trend in the UN. So especially for feminists, for the last, I would say five years or so, they cannot really push forward because they had to defend what they already have. And they are blaming UN. And again, we can talk more about how UN is responding, but what we observe is UN is not really um, supporting them explicitly. Instead, for instance, in CSW meetings, the feminists were blocked 
uh, they, they were not given access in 2015, for instance, because there was too much conflict. And I'm talking about physical conflict. So they are fighting, like really fighting. So um, it, it, of course, in this climate, things cannot be pushed further and everything stops actually. And I read some um, journalists uh, talking about the new Cold War. It's like, um, how UN was paralyzed during Cold War. And they say this is a um, new Cold War based on gender rights. So nothing can be discussed, nothing can be passed. And uh, both sides actually, especially feminists are defending and uh, anti-feminists on the other hand, what we call this backlash advocacy. So it's not, they are just not spoiling. They are really pushing their own again, agenda. They are backlashing. And um, feminists are on the defense and UN is um, not really supporting one side, I would say. And that's, that's the scenery and we can talk about um, details if you have other questions. Thank you so much, Iham, for that. That's, um, I think, a very helpful sort of um, both background and analysis to see this whole conversation in. Um, and also probably really important to think about this as often we speak about sort of the, the next gains and the next steps, but actually in this case, it feels very much like we're also speaking about making sure that we don't move backwards. Um, and, and that's very worrying to see. Um, so we'll turn over to um, the Q&A now. We've got a couple of questions in the Q&A already, but please do, um, please do submit your questions um, through the Q&A function. And we really want to make sure we answer as many of them as we can. Um, Andrea, unfortunately, is having some internet issues, so we're just trying to see if we can bring her back in. Um, but in the meantime, I thought I'd start with a couple of questions just to get the Q&A started. Um, and Heisler, my first question is for you. And it's sort of, um, I was wondering if you could explore a little bit how you feel that your work and sort of the, the conclusions of your work are reflected in the wider um, UN work towards gender equality, and maybe in particularly do you feel that the way that you discussed um, the BRICS countries interpreting WPS to make sure that it fits with, with some of their um, domestic priorities, if, if that has been something that we have seen across the board as it um, we've always seen across the board, or if you think there is something particularly novel to the way that they've conceptualized this? Yeah, I think that uh, there is something uh, new on the way that uh, they try to interpret trade the WPS agenda because of, uh, I think, two different uh, things. The first one is that uh, these countries, uh, they try to show that they are um, the new powers, the new great powers. They try to show to the world their potential. So they, they try to, to permeate all the areas and gender equality is on top of it if you're thinking about the social uh, issues and not the uh, financial. So they are trying to interpret it to show that they are good on it too, not just uh, that they have uh, high, hates of, uh, high rates of uh, uh, grow or something like that. They are showing more. They're trying to interpret the agenda in a way that uh, it just only fits in their proposals but also that shows that uh, they are um, on top of it. This is very important to say. And the second uh, way that they, they think that they have a new uh, aspect is that uh, of claiming the, uh, that they are peaceful despite all the data. So they, they trying to show that they, they have these, I think of, the discourse, the narrative is more important, or they try to, to make it more important than the, the fact, than the data, as, as the, than the information. This is very, very particular on Brick. Um, another thing that uh, uh, we can say that's uh, different is they move, for, uh, move uh, back to the traditional uh, international relations theories. So when say, they say that they are peaceful, they are peaceful in the sense, especially South Africa and Brazil, they are peaceful in the sense of they don't have uh, interstate wars, they don't have interstate conflict. So they, they move uh, back 
to these uh, traditional classical concepts of IR. Uh, in, in the other hand, uh, Russia, India, India and China try to make their own concepts of uh, war and conflict that do not involve uh, their own regions because of uh, there are some uh, regions that are worse than uh, theirs. So I, I really think uh, that, uh, that there is something new on what uh, BRICS are trying to do in, uh, in the open debate. Of course, open debates are very formal. This is important to say that they are very formal place to, to put the, the issues. And this is one of the things that maybe co could change in UN. Uh, when uh, these the spaces are a little bit less formal, the countries can uh, talk in a different way and maybe has more debate and less just speech. It can change uh, the, the pattern of, uh, of the, the debate and maybe the policies in the future. Thank you ever so much. I think it's really interesting to see sort of the distinct weather similarities, but also how this is a sort of new interpretation. So I think that's really important. Um, Andrea, I'm really glad that you um, were able to join us. I hope your internet issues are resolved because the next question is for you, if that's OK. Um, so there's a couple of questions here about um, specifically improving women's representation amongst uh, peace negotiators. Um, so I'll read one of them out here, which is from an anonymous attendee who asks, what does meaningful participation for women in peace negotiations look, negotiations look like? Is it a case of moving beyond added value? Um, and secondly, how can we go about changing the discourse surrounding women's inclusion in peace building processes? Yeah, thank you very much for those really good questions. Um, well, meaningful participation of women uh, thus far often to my reading is defined as women bringing women's issues to the table. Um, whereas other issues that women might bring to the table are considered as uh, not their business. So I think uh, we need to change this and m move beyond those stereotypes and let women, but who are not a homogeneous group that also is important uh, to, uh, to to highlight uh, even though it should be it should be clear but to let people whether women men or uh, uh, any other um, to bring issues to the table that they think are important uh, without others judging upon them whether they are appropriately raising issues or not. And uh, this, I think, also requires to, to listen to uh, women who also have already huge experiences of participating in peace negotiations. So my impression is that there is not so much networking between women who um, have these experiences and women who might newly join peace negotiations. So improving, also learning between and among women would be a very important task for the UN, but also for other actors to facilitate, I think. And this then could also help to uh, increase women's participation in the peace negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And a quick reminder again to please do keep submitting any questions through the Q&A. Um, I've got one quick one here for you, um, Irem, if that is all right. And it goes back a little bit to an earlier point um, about um, making sure that we don't go backwards. Um, and I guess I'm wondering is how can we improve some of the dynamic dynamics that you've detailed? Um, in particular, how do we make sure that we safeguard um, the, the achievements that have already been made, but also, and this sort of um, comes back to a point that you made, which is that um, these conservative groups have learned from the way that feminist groups have managed to um, really make um, important changes at the UN. And I'm just wondering also, are there any um, le lessons that you think the other way around that feminist groups can now learn from the way that conservative NGOs have really um, made an impact in the UN space? Thank you, Leah. So I want to start from your second question. I think there is some realization, not from the way they do politics, but uh, from the feminists that they are entrapped in a polarizing rhetoric. So uh, some feminist groups are, are aware that that kind of polarization does not bring anyone any good. And I see uh, some of them discuss uh, some awareness of this. 
And I think that's a lesson to be learned because we don't know actually uh, from domestic context how there is uh, how do we get out of polarizing dynamics in politics. I think this is an open question for many of the societies around, but um, I see awareness and I think that's that's an important learning process because what has happened so far is. Uh, they were really like mirror images of, it, of each other. So um, conservatives were attacking, feminists were defending themselves, and it goes on and on and on. And so it, it really doesn't help anybody. And um, another um, issue, oh, can you can you uh, repeat your first question, please? And um, just if there, if you have any examples of ways that we can um, make sure that we safeguard the, the achievements that have been made. Well, what happened, what I observed so far is uh, to safeguard is just to stop. So uh, not planning any big meetings, for instance. So uh, 25 years after Beijing conference, they were planning a meeting and then they decided uh, to stop doing it because that would mean going backwards. So, so far what has been done is just really stopping and blocking. Um, but I haven't seen actually any good examples to safeguard, but I see that feminists are uh, coming together. So they are really building a big alliance because there was a lot of divisions among feminists in the UN, especially on South North axis. And I see some feminists addressing these issues because there is this common enemy and that's maybe another lesson to be learned. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we've got loads of questions coming in, so that's great. But again, do please keep submitting them. Um, there's one here um, which says, an, an anonymous question which, are, which asks, how do you believe the stepping down of Angela Merkel will affect feminism and female representation in international politics? And I was hoping to start with the high on, on this one, if that's okay, because I know that in your article, you talk a lot about how a number of the BRICS countries um, use the, the statistics that they have um, almost parity in, in representation of women in sort of um, their institutions or, or political bodies. And I was just wondering how important you think this representation will be, and then more generally, um, the question about Angela Merkel's importance in these discussions. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, political, woman political representation uh, is very important, but <laughs> however, we always need to remember that uh, to and I think that the Iran uh, paper goes in in the sense that uh, to be a woman it doesn't mean that to be a non-conservative woman. So this is uh, something that we need to to keep in mind. And another thing uh, very uh, important is that in Brazil we had uh, um, a female president uh, Dilma Rousseff. And uh, she she was impeachment. She had an impeachment. So and this impeachment was driven uh, by uh, non juridical, non legal uh, ways. So it it was uh, uh, some some of some people, including me, got a coup d'état uh, because it was very complicated. Um, so this is very important. This is, I think that this is the point. Uh, uh, to be a woman doesn't mean that you, it won't be conservative. And the second thing is that the woman will be always challenged uh, for, the, for the society, for the patri patriarchal society, because if uh, they are achieving too much on gender equality or too much in social issues, probably they will have some problems with the men in power. And it was what happened in Brazil. And we, see, we saw uh, the same happen, that happened in, uh, in Argentina and in Chile. It, all the, the women in power in South America had problems uh, when they are in power and they were uh, attacked because they are women. So the political participation comes together with the gender capacity. So this woman that will be empowering needs to, need to be very, very capacity to that. Exactly because when we are women, we need to show two, three, four times more that we are able to do something. And this is not just because we are trying to avoid the backlash, 
but because we need to stay in the power in the place that you already conquered. So uh, in uh, China and uh, in India and especially in South Africa, actually more, more in China and India and Russia, we have uh, a different picture of Brazil and uh, South Africa. We have more gender equality in, in political participation when you're talking a, a less patriarchal society. But uh, in Brazil, we have uh, less than 15% of uh, women in parliament. Uh, is, uh, in South Africa, a little bit more. And in the other three countries, we have uh, uh, the same, uh, the same uh, data, but uh, uh, it's hard to women to, to participate of politics. This is uh, my point. So it, we don't, to be in the place, it doesn't mean that you will be able to do something, be able to, to try to, to put the gender equality as something uh, to pursue and to Except, uh, establish a real public policies on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that answer. And um, we've got another question here, um, which is from Francine Mukwaya, and I'll just read your question out. It says, as an African woman, precisely a Congolese woman human rights activist, my question is this, how can you fix gender equality taking into account culture, belief, diversities, and values? Because it is very important to think to take these into account if we want to work towards solutions. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, I think if it's okay, I might start with you, Iram, because I think one of the points um, that came across in, in your research is that the um, conservative NGOs have done a great job with sort of working together and that maybe this is a, um, something that the sort of feminist movement could learn more from. But of course, it is very important that in doing so that we don't um, remove or ignore the really important sort of um, diversity implications and that it, it's not sort of narrowed down to the points that the, the minimum points that people agree with. So I was just wondering if you'd like to reflect on that question. Oh, thank you very much. And actually, um, I don't think feminists are blind to those issues, but they are framed as blind to those issues. So uh, there are no, there is no one feminist group in the UN. Yes, maybe some versions of feminism are more dominant, and um, we we hear or we see them more. But, but I think um, feminism is 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 very diverse and is very successful in addressing these issues. And uh, on the other hand, anti-feminist actors are really pushing towards these divergences within feminism. So, for instance, what they are doing is they are playing into um, African states. They are saying that these liberal feminists are colonizing you. These are not your norms, but uh, this is their ideologies and this is not your reality. So for instance, when they um, talk about uh, contraception, they're saying, well, contraception is about Western women and, and, and their lives. This is not our reality. So I think there is some ground in there um, to, to discuss what is good for everyone. So. Um, because it's 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 how politics is done. They they do polarize. They do politicize those things, and and I don't think that feminists are blind to those issues. Maybe um, they should address them more in some context, but I would not blame them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, and this um, brings me back to a point which I think was in Andrea's article where um, she says I think it's something like gender was supposed to be transformative and quite often it becomes more of a problem solving tool. And again, I would say, I don't think that is the blame of the groups that brought it there. It's more the blame of the, the processes that end up using the concept. So I think that's a really, really important point. And of course, you know, feminism inherently includes that diversity. It's more about how do we then actually go to the next step of actually implementing that. So I think that's really, really Great point. Thank you so much for the for the question. Um, there was one question that I had for you, actually, Chaisa, in, in sort of a lot of the points that you've made and also in your article, which was um, what you see as sort of the next steps being. So how do we, um, maybe this is an impossible question, so do let me know if it is, um, but how do we encourage and support the great work that the BRICS countries are doing in, you know, taking the lead on the WPS agenda? but simultaneously make sure that, and I guess this goes for a lot of other, other countries as well, 
turn that um, analysis inwards and also look at some of the ways in which WPS should be addressed domestically. Yeah, I think this is very interesting, uh, Leah, because I, I was about to, to, uh, to ask you to answer, to try to answer the other question and it, uh, join your question. So uh, one of uh, the, the issues that uh, I am talking about uh, my, uh, my PhD dissertation is about the localization of uh, WPS. So I think that it works very well to, to break also, because when you're talking about the localization, we, we, they cannot address as foreign policy. They need to address as a domestic policy and a, as a local policy. Uh, and it uh, is very interesting when we are talking about uh, trying to, um, to deal with the cultures, with the traditions. Uh, when you localize it, or instead of making a national action plan or uh, more than making just an action or action plan, you you do a you make a, a local action plan. The the local women, the local organizations, they are trying to solve. They are trying to interpret, to translate the WPS to their needs to what the women really need. Uh, so maybe they will pay more attention in, in gender-based in gender violence, or maybe in political participation, maybe in peace negotiations, depends on the local uh, need and the local issues. So I think that the localization is a good uh, way to solve both problems, the cultural issues, and uh, the not not addressing uh, as a domestic pub, uh, public policy, but as a foreign policy. Uh, the second one is trying to understand that uh, these process take time. So to change a culture, to change a tradition, it takes time. Uh, this is something that uh, I've been learning, especially when uh, when I was um, uh, writing my my thesis about Africa about male uh, genital mutilation and about another uh, practice that harm women, is that to try to show the community that uh, it, it's harming, it's uh, hurting someone, uh, and it is not good. Do, do you want that uh, they do it with you? No, so it's not a good practice. This is the best way to, to approach the, the cultural issue, I think so. And to understand that uh, as everything, it uh, takes time, but we cannot uh, just to sit and wait. Of course, we need to, to try to do our best. For me, the answer is the localization of uh, WPS. It is not been something uh, new, but uh, just in the you know, uh, 10 years from, from now, uh, it's something that we, are uh, we can talk about and we see papers about it. Thank you, Leah. Thank you so much. And thank you for linking the two points, because I think uh, that was really important, you know, like the embedding of these issues and making sure that they are localized is so important, because otherwise the UN can feel like something that is very far removed from the actual situation on the ground. Um, Andrea, I'm so glad you can join us again. I'm so sorry about, about your internet issues, and I hope that you've been able to follow some of the discussion. Um, I have got one question here for you, if that is all right. Um, so the question is as followed, um, are there actions that the UN could take to formalize gender sensitive contributions to negotiations and discussions as a way of protecting that space, perhaps in a way similar to civil society involvement slash accreditation, or is that a particular uh, politically impossible move? Can gender sensitive directives be a whole of UN thing, or does it need to be specific to agencies, committees and bodies within the broader structure? structure? Thank you for this question. I think that's difficult to answer in an either or way. I think both might be needed. Um, so um, there then is need for generalized action, but also for more specific ones. So for example, um, linking my research area back to localization, I think of course there are contact specific issues that hinder women's participation in the peace negotiations and uh, inclusion of sen gender sensitive approaches in the negotiations, such as um, 
local factors. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there were also, or I, I could also identify more generalizable issues that prevent the participation of women, that prevent gender sensitive uh, negotiations. And uh, uh, I think it all comes down in this uh, respect to different expectations uh, raised by different actors. So that on um, average, the domestic negotiators had very different expectations from those that the international actors at least pretend to have, um, which is why um, women I spoke with who participated in peace negotiations said that, well, in order to be accepted by the, the domestic negotiators, they had to sort of adopt a male identity to behave like a man. Um, and then they were accepted by them in the negotiations. So I think uh, it needs some training for uh, domestic negotiators, maybe especially for male domestic negotiators, to for them being trained on accepting women in the negotiations. But uh, the women also, I do think, need some support uh, in order to learn from others who had been at their position the strategies that they employed. Um, and uh, it's difficult to sort of just send international observers or um, facilitators to those negotiations who then should pay attention to uh, gender sensitivity being included. I think that this, I mean, apparently, I think in Colombia this might have worked. This is always considered as the poster child of a peace negotiation and a, a treaty that is very has very gender sensitive language. But as far as I understood, this... Um, on the one hand, came from the pressure by the internationals, but also um, was uh, had lots of ownership from um, local, uh, at least some of the local negotiators. And I think we need both, right? They need have to work together, and the um, domestic actors needs need support. And you need to identify those who are champions, gender champions, whether uh, they are in the military or state negotiation parties or the non-state parties. You need to identify those and then support them, whether it's men or women. Uh, this is, I guess, something that is uh, needed. And this can be generalized, but also context specific. So I think both is important. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thanks so much that you were able to come back into the event because I think that was such an important and really, really interesting response to the question. And um, we're very quickly running out of time. So I thought maybe um, just as the last thing that we could go over in this event is um, perhaps reflecting on, on your research and some of the questions today. Um, I was hoping to ask each of you if maybe um, you could have a think about one key piece of advice that you would have for people involved in the sort of um, international organization UN space, because as you'll know, um, a lot of um, what we are hoping to do in international affairs and with Chatham House more generally is bring um, people who are working in that space and will be on, um, will be part of the event today um, to, together with the research that you've been conducting. So I was wondering if you have one piece of advice for them that, that you think you, that we need to follow in order to um, promote sort of wider gender equality within the organization? Um, that's a very difficult question. I don't know if there's one of you has an answer already formulated so I can give the others some more time to think. Well, I can start with the most obvious because uh, what I've read so far is especially the, for the feminist NGOs. And I think this also applies for the UN. Funding is a huge issue. So and it has it has been uh, a very difficult issue for them, especially when there is this rival, and which is funded by well we don't have evidence for it for uh, but from Russia from uh, other conservative actors and feminists or uh, the UN women cannot fight this alone. So I think funding is a huge issue that we should not um, forget. So we, we usually talk about ideologies and framing, but then funding, it's, it's, it's the elephant in the room, I think. So I, will, I just want to bring this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I think that's really important. And particularly in a, in a situation where you're not sure where the funding is coming from and there it could be an overwhelming um, disparity between how much funding is, is um, on either side. So I think that's a really important point to raise. Um, Haisa, can I go to you next? Yeah, of course. I agree with you, Aaron. I think uh, funding is a, a, an issue. And uh, I add to that, uh, uh, this 
a not so formal uh, debate too could be a, a good uh, a good way to to improve the, the negotiations. We know that uh, uh, especially in uh, Secret Council we have some uh, some uh, like uh, Aria Formula and and others that the uh, NGOs and the other actors can known state actors can uh, participate. Uh, but uh, in open debate, it doesn't happen. Uh, so they are there, but all, um, even in when the non-state actors are talking, they're talking a formal way. And uh, in this sense of a speech, maybe can, uh, it doesn't uh, help uh, a more uh, interesting, a more uh, compromised uh, debate. So to have more non-formal um, spaces uh, at UN can provide uh, helpful and uh, uh, we really, really uh, hope a uh, uh, very promising uh, space to, to debate. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea? Yes, thank you. Well, when it comes to peace negotiation, my impression was that uh, access to the peace uh, negotiation table is mainly given to those who others are afraid could spoil the process. So if you have a weapon, you are admitted at the table because if not, you can spoil it. And uh, often uh, those who are not in such a powerful position, they are neglected, marginalized or excluded. And I think it's important to um, having international actors, including those marginalized groups that are not able to join the table by themselves or force them um, to the table because they are uh, weapon holders. And uh, this not only applies to those who are usually considered as uh, excluded, but maybe also others that uh, do, uh, that, that are not uh, generally considered as those being the marginalized ones. So I think there are maybe more people and groups marginalized that are generally considered to be, and uh, it's important to bring them to the table as well. Amazing, thank you so much. I think those sort of three key points, funding, making sure there are informal spaces and making sure that access is available to a much wider group of people. There are sort of three key points, and I really hope that our um, attendees today can take those with them. Um, and also, as they read um, the three brilliant articles of um, our speakers today, every um, one of these articles is in our chat, as well as some of the previous work that International Affairs has published um, on this topic. So please do uh, take a moment to click all of those links so that you can, um, after the event, um, read all of these pieces. Um, and as we've now exactly hit time, the only thing left for me to say is a huge thank you to Irem, Haisa and Andrea for coming to speak to us today about this really, really important topic. Um, I've learned a huge amount. I didn't get to all of the questions. I'm really sorry to the attendees, um, but thank you. Thank all three of you for, for taking the time to come and speak to us today.